Welcome to the Product Design Podcast. I'm your host, Seth Coolen, founder of UX Cabin, where we create world-class web and mobile apps. I'm excited to bring you a behind-the-scenes look into the lives of some of the most interesting and talented people in product design. We'll get strategic advice on how they got to where they are today and things they wish they would have known earlier in their career. Hey, welcome to the Product Design Podcast. Today we have Simran with us. She is a graduate student and an incoming product design intern at Meta. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. So you have a really unique background and angle as to how you've been able to, you know, secure some really top-notch interviews and internships. Really excited to get to know your journey a little bit more. Why don't you start out and just tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do? Sure. So I'm originally from India and I moved to the United States in 2021. So I came here to study uh, human computer interaction. I'm currently a graduate student at Indiana University Bloomington. My background was in software engineering. And I didn't always know I had to pursue design, but you know, there was something during my bachelor's degree which pushed me in this direction and here I am. So I'm also, as you mentioned, an incoming product design intern at Meta starting next week. And super excited for that and really excited to talk to you as well. Awesome. Awesome. So Maybe tell a little bit of uh, background on how you started to go into computer science. What even led you to that? And then what led you to come over to the States? Sure. So I like I think like most of the people, I didn't know what I wanted to do after I finished like my junior college or high school. I had some passion for computers and technology. So I was like, okay, let's start studying computer science. It kind of sounds fun. So I got my bachelor's degree in engineering and information technology and during uh, the bachelor's degree i realized that we code so many things and not necessarily like everything which we make is usable by people and uh, there are a lot of people still who find technology so difficult to use so i kept studying this problem and then i discovered something called as user experience design completely unaware of ux design before that and I started studying uh, it. I started watching YouTube videos, uh, you know, reading a few articles on Medium. And I found it to be super, super interesting. So, and it is also something which really helps solve a lot of people's problems. So that is how I decided that, yeah, I'm really interested in uh, design. But still, there was a long way to go, right? Like I was doing my bachelor's in computer science. I didn't really have a design background, so it was so difficult to get a job in design. But, you know, at that point, I knew that, okay, I probably want to make a switch. And then is when the actual hard part started on getting a job and then actually starting my career yeah, that's really interesting. So I guess I'll preempt this with a story on my end. So I actually started out in front end development and I got my first job as a front end developer. And about a year into my job, I was like, I like front end. I think it's cool, but I think I can be a lot better at design. And I have kind of like a ceiling at, on like my, you know, personal like skill set in development. And I could be good and, and go on, but I think I have like a higher ceiling in design. Yeah. How did you, you know, determine that you wanted to turn away from being fully an engineer and go into design? Well, I think there were a few internships during my bachelor's degree where I was actually like making these apps or even the projects where I was coding something out. And when I used to go and show those projects to people or a few of my professors, I always had to like explain them how to make it work. Like, you know, you have to click over here, you have to click over there, you know, and then that is how it's going to function. And I always found that a little uh, odd because I don't have to explain what I've made. People should understand. So I think, yeah, that is how I decided that, you know, design is what... I wanted to, so. Cool. Yeah, and then what led you to come over to the States? Well, after my bachelor's degree, I struggled a lot to find like a design job. 
everyone else was, you know, getting these high paying salaries in software engineering. And then there was me who was, you know, struggling to find a job in design. But after that, I was fortunate enough to land a job as a product designer. And then I decided that, you know what, I want to learn uh, all the theory behind design. I want to meet people who, uh, you know, actually are like me, who have, you know, uh, studied design for a really long time. So I found this amazing program at uh, IU, which had a human computer interaction talk uh, taught a lot about design. So I decided to come to the state. Wow, that's fascinating. We talk with people all the time who either got like a degree in like graphic design and then later on switched over to UX. We've talked with people who went through boot camps and made a career change or people who have gone the self-taught route. I'd be really interested to hear your perspective of like, going through something that is probably the closest thing we have to a UX degree or even, you know, product design degree. I'd be really interested to hear your experience thus far in that. Well, it has, it has been like very good uh, because before I used to learn a lot from YouTube videos and, you know, Medium blogs that nothing was very structured. I would say like it was very random. I used to find one. A video on YouTube and just start learning from that. Then just like one random article on Medium or a podcast. But I think the curriculum over here is pretty structured. If I'm taking a class in design methods, like research methods, I only learn about those. I have professors who are always like willing to like to help me with all of the questions I have. We have projects from industry partners. So they come in and you know, they give all these lectures and how things work in the real world. And even they are available to uh, always mentor us. So I think the curriculum is very really structured in a way. And there's like the right things which they provide you to read, which makes it like even more better from your end because you don't have to take, you know, extra efforts to go on the internet and search for the right thing which you have to study. But they provide yeah. you all the material. So I think my experience so far has been really good in terms yeah. of like getting you know all the basics cleared and the foundation sure yeah. sure but, yeah now do you have like friends or associates who have gone different routes who have done either self-taught route or boot camps or anything like that that you were like comparing when you were deciding what you wanted to do uh i know a few people who had done a uh, graphic design or animation when I was working back in India as a designer and then they had switched to UX design. So those people were kind of working as a UI designer before and then they were making that switch to UX. Uh, I think most of the people were learning from the internet because I don't think I've met anybody who has taken a boot camp yet. Yeah. But because there are so many resources online and like everything is pretty good, like uh, YouTube videos, podcasts and medium articles they are so detailed and so informative that is enough for somebody to you know make a switch I decided that I want to you know meet people who have been doing design for like 20 years that's like, that's like my professors and that is why I decided to you know come to the states to get a formal degree sure yeah there's certainly no one size fit all or like one prescribed route that folks need to take yeah but I'm wondering if there's like certain characteristics or, you know, personality types that do better in different environments. So I know you mentioned a lot of the structure that you get and it kind of gives you the learning path and you probably uh, do really well when you have like deadlines and assignments and things versus, you know, someone who, if you're going to learn online or do the self-taught route, you probably have to like be pretty regimented and structured on your own self, which is a bit of extra overhead. I'd be curious to know if you notice anything particularly in yourself that you just know yourself aware enough to know, like I would do better at a university environment. I, I was looking for some sort of mentorship because there are times when I feel that, you know, I am not good enough to probably go into design. And there's always this fear inside me that, you know, I am not from a formal design background. I do not have a degree. I've not studied it properly as an academic career. So 
probably I would make a lot of mistakes. That is why being in a university where I have professors who are always ready to, you know, help. When I have, when I'm surrounded by like so many peers who, you know, so excellent at design. It's always very nice to, you know, go to them and talk about all these different things, get their feedback, study with them for interviews. And I think uh, the general mentorship and the peer environment which I've got in university is something which I was kind of looking for when I wanted to make that switch. But I've seen a lot of people uh, when I was back in India doing my job who are trying to make a switch from graphic or UI design to UX. They used to like just work in UI design but always used to connect to a designer who was a UX person and then try to, you know, get feedback on how are they doing what they are doing, trying to learn from them. So I think just like going out and seeing what people are doing and learning from them is also like a very good way. Yeah. One thing you mentioned in there about like being able to meet people and kind of build your network going yeah. to university is probably the most valuable understated thing that people don't realize. I think you can probably get really good curriculum or really good education online or wherever but like you said i think the the secret sauce to like why a university might be really advantageous is the network the yeah. professors the connections that you make from there yeah and you come and then you study other people's stories how they approach getting a job or how they approach just general design you meet them you work in groups you understand how they think and I think that really expands your knowledge. Yeah, absolutely. If you're just doing YouTube tutorials online, that is really good and helpful, but you don't get to necessarily work with others or uh, show your work to people or get feedback from people. So I, I certainly see how that can be a limitation. And collaboration is like so important in any job to which you have in design. Like you have to talk to engineers, you have to talk to other designers. You always have to work together. Like there would be very few circumstances in which you are working alone. So I think this environment also gives you an experience for that when you're you know, actually stepping into the industry. Yeah. So if there are other engineers listening and they, you know, potentially want to make the switch to product design, what would be your advice to them? Well, I would say, first of all, there's no harm in trying out. If you uh, think that, you know, UX is something for you, you should definitely give it a try. You never know what works out because I think nothing worked out for me. Also, in the start, I was also struggling. I saw like other people getting all these fancy jobs that here I was like still struggling and looking for jobs. It might take a lot of time, but once you get there, once you have... Uh, which I've learned a lot once you have gained some experience, everything would be wonderful. Uh, I would also say that the learning, uh, there, there is a learning curve and the learning might be a little slower, but you know, eventually you will get there and it's never like you you have learned everything because design is so, so vast. And I've seen like a lot of people who are trying to make this, which they are always trying to learn like everything and know everything. But you'll never know everything because there are so many articles, there are so many podcasts, there are so many papers. You can't like really know everything and it's always evolving. There are always new concepts coming. So you'll keep on learning and don't be afraid that there's something which you're missing or something which you've not learned. It will eventually come. Finally, I would say that believe in yourself. When I was making that switch, I had a lot of doubt that, you know, am I doing it right? I'm giving up all my software engineering placements and I'm looking for a design job. But I would say that if you really have that passion, just believe in yourself, you will eventually get there. Yeah, I think that's really good advice. <clears throat> and like something in the design realm that's not really talked about in the development realm is like, I think there's a huge discussion on like, should designers code and kind of this push for like designers to have competency on the development side. But there's not a lot of discussion on like, should developers design? And I think mm -hmm. if you are an engineer and you're like, ah, maybe I like product design or maybe I want to switch. It's like, I think there's also a path that 
you could go down and say like, I want to be an engineer who's just like super focused on good user experience. It doesn't necessarily have to be one or the other. It's just like, and, and maybe that even gives you an edge. Cause I think there's kind of this mantra of like, I'm a dev. I don't think about anything design. I just implement it pixel perfect. And if I can do that, then, you know, that's my job. But I think there might be a unicorn on the engineering side where it says like, Hey, I'm really good at engineering, but I also really care about UX design and I'm going to be a student of this and be awesome at it and be able to participate in those types of conversations without having to give up like my engineering background or my core skill set as an engineer. I think those kind of engineers are so good to collaborate with, honestly, because I, I worked with one such engineer uh, before coming to my master's degree and she was super interested in user experience. She had a very unique perspective and she also used to, you know, suggest me these different patterns which she thought could do the same job but would be easier to code or which would take like lesser engineering resource. So I think working with those kind of people is also so awesome. But I also feel that if uh, developers start designing properly, then uh, probably the design would be very limited because there's yep. always a thought in their mind that, you know, what I'm designing, uh, I have to code that as well. So you know, probably you never know, like if you would get like some very crazy idea, would you just like reject it and not have it on the table at all? So right. You'd be more pragmatic about your designs <laughs> for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a really good point. But yeah, I think one theme that we've you know heard in this podcast is like, it doesn't hurt to know more about the fields and skill sets that surround yours, even if they're not yours. So it's like, it is never a bad thing to know more context about front-end development. Yeah. It's never going to hurt you to know more about user experience design, even if that's not your job. It just makes you a more valuable player on the team. Yeah. And I think the more you close yourself off to that is to your own detriment. So yeah. you can't be an expert in everything and you shouldn't try to be, but I think you can't close yourself off to understanding these technologies and the implications of any field within the creative space. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think as a designer, your job is not only, you know, to make things pretty or, you know, to make something usable, but it is also understanding all these different perspectives of a business. Like there would be something which the sales team really, you know, wants in your product or something which the operations team wants or you know, something which the engineers also want to develop. You also have to consider all of these resources and how your designs are going to help all these sections of the business instead of just coding it. So I think it's like a balance of all of the, you know, different operations in the business and having knowledge of like everything really helps. Yeah, absolutely. So we're kind of at this really interesting part in your career journey where you've made the switch to UX and product design, you've got an internship, and you actually had a number of offers from different internship opportunities. Why don't you just tell us a little bit about how many offers you had and how you were able to, you know, secure so many different offers for internship opportunities? I definitely think that it was so, so difficult because I didn't work at very fancy companies in India before and I didn't have that much experience as, you know, my peers over here. Uh, everybody has come from, you know, like a design background. I did have like really good jobs. So I always had that fear in me that, you know, would I be able to do it or not? But I think working hard is something which I found to be very useful and just like not giving up because you encounter with so many rejections. Like, yes, I did get many offers, but I got rejected by more company. Yeah. <laughs> I think I got rejected by like 20, 30 firms. But I think not taking that rejection seriously and just like taking all the feedback which you get critically working on and just moving past it would really help because uh, searching for a job is such a difficult time mentally and you have so many things going on with your school you get all these rejections and then you're also studying for the interviews and it, it's very difficult to stay focused 
So I think like just dealing uh, very nicely with rejection really helps. And I think starting early is something which really, really helped me during my interviews because I like a lot of companies start opening up their applications in like August and by August we you need to, you know, be ready with your portfolio, your resume and uh, people who start in the fall semester also usually start in August. So it's usually like when they start applying for internships, it's kind of a little late with start applying in October or November. So starting early is something which helped me when I was like doing all these, uh, you know, interviews with my school, there often came circumstances when I had to prioritize. So I kind of at that time focused on what was important and what needed to be done at that time. Prioritizing helps a lot because I think you can't do everything that you want to do. So I think, yeah, that helped me a lot. Yeah. It's always very nice to build all these meaningful relationships with people because getting into big companies is so difficult. Building meaningful relationships is so, so difficult uh, because you often see all these people on LinkedIn and you don't know how to approach them. But when you uh, go and talk to people, learn about their journeys, get some advice from them, it's always nice to you know learn what how these people have reached where they are take their feedback and you learn from them and then you eventually know what you have to do and what you don't have to do yeah so, yeah and then i got offers from facebook amazon pwc discovery and sezzle i worked at sezzle in my spring semester and i'm an incoming phase well, internet facebook now wow so just to kind of review you are an individual who did not have a background in design you came from a different country, you are a woman breaking into tech, and you were able to land like five different internship opportunities by humongous companies. That is amazing. And <laughs> absolutely, this is not meant to come across the wrong way. But I think, you know, for anyone listening, like if you can do this, anyone can do this, right? Yep. And it's just getting to that secret sauce of like how you did this. And I think you spoke a little bit to that in just your grit in being able to persevere and continue and to not take rejection personally, but to take it and improve from it. So maybe we start off just talking about like, how did you even find these internships in the first place to apply to? Yeah. So the funny part was I always wanted to work at Meta and the very first job alert which I ever set uh, was Facebook. So I went to Facebook's portal and I set like a job alert for US design internships. I did so for other companies as well where I really wanted to work at. And I also went and set all these different job alerts on LinkedIn because LinkedIn is a super wonderful source of finding different jobs at uh, Indeed was one of them. So yeah, I used to get uh, regularly get all these uh, job notifications every morning, browsing through all these different jobs, seeing if any companies have opened their jobs, and then you know approaching people from those companies, asking them if they were they are willing to refer me to a position. Oh, um, how did that go? Uh, so as I said, like building meaningful relationships is so important. I had started talking to people from a really long time. I was working on my portfolio. I was trying to get their feedback. You know, people who are working at all these big companies and I already had their, you know, mental internships. So they were ready to, you know, like refer me to all of these positions. So wow. that worked out well for me. And, so, uh, yeah. so you weren't just blindly applying to these, doing like the normal, like LinkedIn, just like quick apply. You were kind of Ooh. laying the groundwork with meeting yeah. people, networking people from these companies, building relationships before actually applying to these. Yes. And that is so important because blindly applying to these companies very rarely helps you because uh, it's so difficult that there, there are so, so many applicants and, you know, everybody is good. Like most of the people have experience, you know, many people have worked on a lot more projects than you have 
But if you have that support of that one person who is vouching for you, who says that, you know, they have seen your work, they've seen your passion in design, I think that really, really helps you with your job application. So that uh, is, I think connections is so important. So important. That's fascinating. Yeah, it's kind of like creating a little side door in a way. <laughs> so I think that's fantastic advice. I can even attest to you know, people who have just like reached out to me in the past and just kind of made a connection and wanting to connect about maybe some future potential opportunity at, at UX Cabin. So I think anytime that you can have a warm introduction, have a referral is going to put you immediately to the top of the list versus just randomly applying to something. I, I always feel that, you know, getting a reference shouldn't be your sole goal, I would say. You know, it's always about talking to other people and understanding their journey, getting their feedback on your work because uh, they have gone through the exact same steps which you want to go through. They have done their share of interviews. They have also interviewed a lot of people. So their perspective on your portfolio is so important. I think I spent a lot of time before actually applying for jobs, talking to so many people, getting their feedback on my portfolio, writing all of the feedback down and keep, you know, iterating on my portfolio just to make sure that I'm taking advice of most of these people, most advice, I would say. I don't think I've taken all of the advice, but I made sure that I spoke to everybody because it's so important to understand everybody's perspective. I think it's like being a designer over here also because, you know, when you're a designer, you also take feedback from everybody else. You talk to users because your product is going to be used by them. I think same with job applications also. Your portfolio is going to be seen by the recruiters, the hiring managers. So always getting their feedback before you actually make the application just helps. Yeah. So maybe walk us through like your process for connecting with folks like do you just send them like a random linkedin message do you find their email like what goes into that initial you know message that is interesting enough for them to engage and reply well i think i did a lot of linkedin cold messaging also but it was not like you know hey would you give me a reference but it was more like you know i like your journey i i did go to their linkedin profile i studied what they used to do before i went to their portfolio i saw their projects and i found that okay they are doing some really interesting work they have a very inspiring journey so i used to like message them uh, there's also this mentorship platform called adp list and i used to go on that and find mentors talk to them I spoke to so many people and sometimes you'd find that there are a few mentors who you really sync up with, like they are just amazing, whatever they tell you, it's always like, oh yeah, they are right. There are some mentors who you wouldn't find super helpful, but I think I found most of them very helpful. I had been like so many connections after that and after every call, I used to feel very happy that I spoke to somebody and got their feedback on my I had like a list of actionables every time I spoke to them and I knew what I wanted to do next. There were also mentors who told me that Simran, now you need to stop and now you need to start applying for jobs because as a young designer, there's always this thing of overworking on your portfolio, trying yeah. to make it perfect, but it never will be perfect. So these people always were there for me. They always told me, okay, Simran, now you need to stop. Now you need to start applying for jobs. There's a lot more things which are going to come ahead. And oh, I think talking to people was so helpful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you yeah, would find mentors on ADP list. You would reach out to folks in a really thoughtful way. I think one really good takeaway from that is like people like to hear about themselves. They like to hear, you know, praise about themselves. They like to hear like, in it, encouraging words. So it's like, if you come off the bat and you're just like, hey, can you give me a reference for your company? That's like jumping way too far in the end of the deep end before you've offered any sort of value or conversation or friendship to someone and uh, love your approach in, you know, kind of studying their background and their portfolio and just, you know, being curious about them. And I think 
that's probably why you saw a lot of success in being able to connect and network with these folks. And I think it also helps to talk to them and show your passion. So because if they are referring you, they are kind of vouching for you. So if they understand that you are somebody who has really done well, or even if you don't have enough experience, you are somebody who, you know, has a lot of passion for the work which you are going to be doing. I think they'd be like happy to, you know, refer you. But it's just about like building that relationship first. Yeah. So, you know, we could have talked about the the very beginning, the tip of the spear getting that first warm introduction, but there's a lot more that goes into getting an offer than just the initial application. So, you know, we got interviews, we got portfolio reviews, we got all sorts of things. What were your interviews like and how did you navigate those in a good way? So uh, my very first interview, which I got from PWFC, was all about like behavioral questions. And I had to like literally prepare in one day. I got an interview like on Wednesday, a request on Wednesday, and I was supposed to interview on Thursday. So uh, it was mostly a behavioral interview. I've seen like a lot of people just like die hard, take questions and answers. But what I did was I just like reflected on my experiences. I just remembered what I did in my first job, what I did in my second job, what I'm currently doing in my master's program. What I did in my engineering, very much like a conversation rather than, you know, like a formal interview. And the interviewer also was super happy with me because uh, we spoke about a lot of things, not just design. We spoke about like, our hobbies, then what we like to do in our free time. And it was very nice. So I think being confident and being honest really helps in behavioral interviews. And just like don't make up story, but just tell what really happened just be honest with like your entire journey and even if you don't have that experience the interviewer would really understand that you know you are somebody who is really liking what you're doing you have that uh, you know passion for what you want to do and they would really like you in that case for portfolio presentation I think I did so much research and practicing is the key for like every everything we have peers around us we have professors we have so many different people mentors from ADP list or LinkedIn you always go present make a portfolio presentation present it to them get their feedback and we work on it and for app critique also I would say that you have so many peers just like gather together on a Sunday or on a weekend just like everybody could do like one app critique when you listen to different people you'll understand that know how they think and what you're lacking or you know you give feedback to each other you share I think that is the best way to like study for the interviews yeah yeah that's that's great so you know as you're interviewing what what do you think the the employers are looking for the hiring managers are looking for in these internship type of jobs are they looking for you know more so someone who is like eager and passionate and, and a good fit or are they looking for someone who is specifically geared towards the technical skill set of the position what are they what are they looking for from your perspective i think it kind of depends on the companies but the ones which i have interviewed for i wouldn't say that my interview was perfect oh uh, i had a few set of skills which they wanted in an intern but I also did not have everything which they want. I think one thing which they are looking for is if you are eager to learn or not. If you show that, you know, you're not somebody who is like stubborn or what knowledge you have, but you're always willing to read about, you know, like different topics which are there. We keep learning. I think that is what, um, that is a skill which they are looking for. It. And I think that also kind of helps. So it's fine that you don't have like literally all of the skills which are mentioned in the job description, but be willing to, you know, like open up and be willing to learn from them. I think that is what they are looking for, according to me. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. I think honesty in saying like, I don't know versus like a muffled answer. Like if you yeah. can just be honest versus try to sidestep it you're going to look better in the eyes of the interviewer for yeah. sure but yeah so maybe we talk a little bit about your portfolio and 
what were your strategies in that? Or like, what did you learn that you changed in your portfolio from like your initial stab at it to where it is today? Well, there were so many iterations, I would say. And I think that was kind of one of the mistakes which I had made was overworking on my portfolio. A uh, portfolio is just something which gets you that initial, uh, you know, interview. And uh, after that, literally, like, it's all about your portfolio presentation and how you interview. So I think uh, not overworking on your portfolio is very important because you always try to make it so perfect and it never is. And I think just getting an MVP of portfolio and then just like stopping and then focusing on everything else really works. But I think uh, a few of the tips which work for my portfolio was first of all making it scannable because a lot of people are not going to spend like 10, 15 minutes reading each and every part of your case study, but they are just going to scan through it. So make proper use of titles, like titles are so important. Instead of you no know, naming the title as problem statement, you can actually write down the problem statement in a few words in the title. So, you know, be making better use of these uh, titles, uh, I think one very nice advice which I got from one of my seniors was that make your portfolio scannable in such a way that a person should be able to read it in five seconds, 10 seconds, five minutes, and 10 minutes. So, you know, making use of all these titles, then writing descriptions, images play such an important role because um, if a job description says that you need to know why you're framing, and if you have an image which has where you made different sketches or frames, I think that really sings up that, okay, I'm in need of somebody who knows how to do competitive analysis or, you know, somebody who does journey mapping, somebody who does wireframing. And if you have all of those points in your portfolio, it really, really helps. Uh, I think one advice which I had got was also like making your portfolio short, but I was ne never able to do it <laughs> because... I wanted to present like everything I had. Every time I went and tried to shorten my portfolio, I could never do that. But that was one of the advice which I got. And then I think storytelling was so important in the portfolio because a, a recruiter sees so many portfolios every day. Like it's just like the same thing which is happening. So how do you tell your story? What is unique about your project which you have? presented in your case study um, tell uh, I think telling a story about you know like how what what are some obstacles which you encountered and how did you overcome them or uh, you know what did you do as a designer which was you know different from everything else write about like your impacts or uh, you know the metrics afterwards like did you show it to the users how did they find and then also reflecting on your project. Like, what did you learn from this? As an intern, again, they want uh, somebody who can learn a lot of things. So, you know, what did you learn from this project? What were the mistakes you made? What would you do differently? So I think highlighting all of those points in your portfolio really helps. But knowing when to stop uh, is, again, super important. Yeah, I'm, I'm just looking at your portfolio now. And to kind of just verbally describe it i'm looking on here and i don't see anywhere on the page that really has more than like three lines of text before it is broken up by some other element like you've got titles you've got banners you've got call outs with numbers call outs with emojis images that separate the text quotes that give it visual hierarchy very good use of different column structures, different headers and subheaders that really break it up. And yeah, you can scan it and, you know, know where you are. You can dive deeper and read, read through each point. But I think this is a fantastic portfolio to have a lot of information, but in a really digestible manner. And so I think Pairing this sort of portfolio with your approach to networking is a silver bullet for sure. Yeah. And I think like everything which you see in my portfolio wasn't like my first iteration. I would say that was literally like my hundredth iteration because I showed it to so many people and I did have that problem of, you know, like 
uh, over writing something or writing like big chunks of paragraph, but you know, connecting with people and talking to them. They really helped me shorten the text and they showed me that, you know, Simran, this is not needed. You don't need this section, just remove it. So, you know, feedback was so important to get to the stage where I am currently from the first version of my portfolio. Yeah, that is great. So what was the feedback in your portfolio reviews? Was it honest and open feedback or were they, you know, did they look through it and just say, okay, thank you, we'll consider this? Or did you get like feedback in your interviews? Well, there were a few mentors who told me, you know, it's fine and you should go. But there were other uh, mentors who, whose advice I found so valuable. They uh, scanned literally like everything on my portfolio. They were so candid after, you know, like take out the time and go through each and every word I had written. They told me that it was not good or it was, it was not going to work. They were very open about it. Sometimes after getting on the call, I used to feel that, you know, I have so much to work on and I used to kind of get overwhelmed at that point. But, you know, I knew that now I've made a list of actionables. This is something which I'm going to prioritize. And then I used to kind of like work through it. I used to, again, reach back to these mentors and ask them that, hey, uh, I've made the changes which you just told me. Would you be willing to you know, like get on another call with me? Eventually, when I started doing that, that is when a few of my mentors started telling me that, okay, Sabrin, now you have reached your... MVP now you can stop and now start applying and try to focus on what's next. Uh, you have other set of actionables through which you can make your portfolio better, but that's for later. You don't have to prioritize it right now, but yeah, yeah, we keep on doing it later. Now, in your application process, did you do anything extra? send a video overview or send like a direct email to the hiring person or was there any edge that you gave yourself outside of the normal application process other than having that network of potential referrals? I think after uh, you get that first side of interview and like if you go ahead in the process, I think the recruiters at the hiring managers, at least the ones which I've met are very very kind enough to you know always like follow up on you know if i've been selected for the next round or if I haven't been i think one thing i do after all of my interviews is like just write an email saying that you know thank you for your time and it was very nice speaking to you just so that probably they remember me but it's always also about like yeah they have taken their time to talk to you and even after the interview, they are very kind enough to give the feedback and it's always wonderful talking to them. So I, I do write an email after oh, every interview of mine, just thanking them for it. Yeah. That's all I do. Did you have to write any cover letters or anything like that? I've never written a cover letter, never. Interesting. <laughs> what about uh, resume? Did you have to spend a lot of time on your resume? Yes, I did. So I think resumes are very important when it comes to applying for jobs. And there are also these, uh, I, I don't think like when you apply for a job a uh, recruiter, I think in most companies, they don't go through everybody's resumes, but there's an automatic machine, which actually reads your resumes and then determines if you're a good fit or not. So designing for that or designing your resume for that is also so important. I had made my first resume on Figma, which wasn't very trackable with these systems. So ah. yeah, so I used to like get instant rejection. So I spoke to so many people. I did a lot of research and I found that, you know, if you make it on Google uh, Docs or Word or Pages, that would like really help. So I uh, converted my resume from Figma to Google Docs. And then um, there are a lot of these ATS uh, websites where you can go. So there's jobscan.co where you actually enter the job description, you put your resume and then you see if it's like a match or what. So that really helped me understand wow. if my resume is trackable or not. So I did a lot of work on my resume. Also like highlighting uh, the impacts and, you know, I think 
some things which are measurable, uh, like how many screens I designed or how many users I talked to, how many interviews conducted, writing all of that on my resume also helped me. Yeah. I am, yeah, I'm looking at your resume right now and it is, I think as designers, like you probably wanted to design it in Figma and make it look really nice and yeah. be like, I'm a designer. See, my resume proves it. But in looking at your existing resume, like it's laid out very nice, but it is, it does not have any like special design to it. it yeah. You know, it's basically title with text and bullet points and it's one page and i'm guessing yeah. that is intentional did you want to keep it to simply one page or did it just kind of work out that way oh i wanted to keep it one page because that was an advice which a lot of my seniors gave that you know you never make two page resume that it should be something which fits in one page because Nobody is going to sit down and read two pages of your resume. You have to shorten it to just like one page. You have to tell them that you are capable of doing a particular job in just one page. So it was a lot of struggle, I would say. I, but I did shorten a lot of things to keep it in one page. Uh, when I was making my resume for the very first time, I actually made it very decorative with like a lot of colors. Right. But uh, many seniors told me that, you know, all of this formatting kind of gets washed out when your uh, that system is tracking your resume. So there's no point. So try making it as simple as possible so that the machine reads the important things and does not focus on like reviewing or formatting. Yeah. Yeah. Now I'm looking at your resume and I am seeing that all of your work experience is very directed towards product design experience. Yeah. So you you did not include any of your engineering background, and I'm I'm guessing that was specific and intentional as well. Oh, this is my current resume because I have that like since I have come to the United States and just like one year before that. I have been doing a lot of work in product design. That is why it is like. Sure. But during my very first uh, job application or even like last year when I was making my application for internships, I did have my experiences from engineering. So I worked as a developer uh, during my bachelor's degree. And I also included, but I kind of wrote it in a different way because when I was also developing that, I was also uh, responsible for the front-end development. So. I also did some sort of designing, sure. initial design. So, you know, I wrote it in a way that it seemed like I've also designed and done up something. Sure. So, you know, making your resume very relevant to the job which you're applying to really helps. Yeah, I think it's tough because some people are coming into like a career switch and the only thing that they have relevant to the job is maybe a boot camp or like freelance projects. So. I think there's there's certainly some strategy to being able to like look back on your previous experience and be like, what can I take from this? What can I include in this that is relevant for product design? Like maybe you're doing product design type of things as a receptionist or as a, you know, customer service rep. Like, I don't know, think about it, be creative. What I've seen like a lot of people do is if even if you don't have that experience with respect to like design, a lot of people take on these personal projects because there are so many problem statements that you see currently. They take on that problem statement, they work on it and they just like write that in form of projects on their resume just to, you know, make sure that I have done something in design and yes, I have done it. So it's worth writing and it is relevant. So yeah, I think even I have done, like I found the internet is full with so many amazing problem statements, which you can just like start designing. I, I also had done something like that when I didn't have enough things to write on my resume, just pick a problem statement or try working on it and include it in your resume. It's fine. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. I'm looking here. You have obviously work experience, you have contact information. You have education, you have skills. I'm guessing in this skills area might be the place where you are putting those specific terms that the computer might yeah. notice that. So that's definitely a good strategy. But then you also have this area for leadership of like, you know, what you've done as a mentor, how you've helped 
fellow students, how you've published things on Medium and started to make a, a personal brand. So I think, you know, this is definitely a, a good example to follow that we'll link up in the show notes for others to, you know, be able to look at and take inspiration from. Yeah, definitely. And I think all of these sections, I would say I did not have them when I was starting. I knew that, okay, there are a few things which are, so for example, leadership. I do not have enough examples of leadership. So I started like, you know, working on those things. So I think one very important advice, which one of my mentors had given me was making word clouds. I used to read job descriptions of Facebook, Microsoft. I used to like make word clouds and I used to see what skills are something which are, you know, common in all of these. And I tried including those skills on my resume. Not that I don't know how to do it. I know how to do it and I tried to, you know, be very specific about what right. I'm writing. So I kind of did that research also that, you know, what is the term which is uh, going on in the industry? And I tried to include those. Yeah, that, that's great. Kind of just wrapping up this episode, there's tons of people out there who are trying to break in or trying to switch careers and kind of hitting a wall. What advice would you give to people who maybe they've applied for a thousand internships and a thousand jobs and they can't seem to make any traction? What advice would you give them? Well, first of all, build connections because connections help you so much. They would like, they may really help you. Like I cannot like emphasize on the importance of building meaningful relationships with people. Oh, I would say the next thing is do not overwork your portfolio. I've seen a lot of people spending so much time on their portfolio that they sometimes literally miss the application deadline or they just don't apply for their job because they think that my portfolio isn't good enough. Just just go ahead and apply. It's fine if you don't get it. You'll understand. But don't uh, postpone your application just for your portfolio. Then I would say that if you do not have relevant work to show, uh, pick out projects or uh, do a lot of, you know, personal projects. There are so many prompts on internet where you can go and find a problem statement. So start working on, you'll always like in the end, if you do it properly, you'll always have, a, I would say a portfolio piece to put if you don't have any work experience. And I think one thing which I've seen is that people do not make early applications. And that is something which has worked for me. Uh, every time job opened, I made sure that I applied in the first 24 hours because oh. uh, I've seen that a lot of people delaying it because either their portfolio is not finished, their resume is not finished. So I used to spend like two hours every day making sure that if there's a new job, I apply to it as soon as possible because I think early application helps. I can attest to that too, it, it, the early application perspective for just when we launched our internship. We had a ton of people applying and just the nature of, I don't know, human psychology. I was really interested in who was applying at first and I paid a lot of close attention to the initial applications just because I'm like, I don't know, I don't know how we're going to get it. Like I'm going to look at the first ones that come in. But then, I mean, we had so many that honestly, I, I couldn't even look at all of the ones that came in at the end. Right. So it was like. I think that's fantastic advice. I think, you know, you have really helped give a template, a framework for people to be able to successfully stand out from the crowd in a really crowded space. And I think your strategies can work for anyone. And I think kind of what you said in the beginning of just like, this is a lot of hard work and you have to be willing to do these things that are necessary to, you know, get those interviews, get noticed make connections. And it's like, there's no automated or shortcut way for that. And yep. that barrier to entry is kind of nice because it means that like, if you're doing it, there's probably not a, a ton of other people doing it. So you can do the hard work to stand out, but it is going to take yep. work. Yeah. It's going to take a lot of work. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, Simran, this has been amazing. Thank you so much for the time. And I wish you uh, all the best in your future endeavors. Thank you so much. It was wonderful talking to you too. 
Thanks so much for hanging out with us today on the Product Design Podcast. If you enjoyed our conversation, be sure and go follow our guests. Let them know they did a great job and you learned a lot. Um, more to come in the following weeks as we bring on new guests. Please hit that subscribe button so that you will get these podcasts uh, and learn a ton about the product design community. Excited to see you next time. Thanks.